Hello, everyone, and welcome to this next edition of AMI Sites. I will be your host today. I'm Lynn Ozer, president of Multifunding. Unfortunately, my co-host, Ami Kassar, CEO of Multifunding, is not available today. So I get to interview our special guest all by myself, and I'm looking forward <laughs> to it. Today, we have Sarah Noel Block, the founder of Tiny Marketing. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you. It's good to be here. <laughs> <laughs> it's so nice to have you. Um, I want to get started. You have an interesting background and a great company. And um, as I mentioned to you, so many of our listeners are entrepreneurs themselves and are very interested in your journey. And also, they'll be very interested in tiny marketing and the services <laughs> that you offer. Tell us from the beginning and how you ended up with your own company. Oh my gosh, I started off scared. That's how <laughs> I started off. That's a great I, answer. <laughs> yeah, I um I started freelancing and building tiny marketing on the side while I was the head of marketing in oh. corporate. Oh, you did, so you went to school to be in marketing. You never I've always that. yeah, I've always been in marketing and it was always my thing. Like forever. <laughs> What, and what was your first job in marketing? My first job was as a marketing quarter coordinator, not a quarter, <laughs> for a building materials company. Oh. And I kind of just like ended up in that world of all things building, like real estate investing, building materials, facility management, which is kind of funny for a check usually yeah, <laughs> like surely I was is. usually the only girl in the room <laughs> uh, that's right so that's that <laughs> is really interesting at marketing you know a lot of times there's a lot of women in it but not exactly in that field so did you yeah. start um with this while you were in college or was it after um no I started right after college it was my first job and I mean, honestly, I always knew that I wanted to do that. You know, when you do those um, those tests in high school, they're like, what should you be when you grow up? Oh, yeah. Cooter interest tests or yes. something like that. Would you I rather got marketing. be this or that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I always I got marketing. It was just you like in it. my DNA. Yes. How about that? Yeah. So, but that first job that I was telling you about, I got yeah. laid off. It was 2008 and everybody was getting um, laid off. Great. So I was absolutely, yeah, I was terrified and I did not want to be in a position again where I was relying on one stream of income. And after that, I started freelancing while working corporate mm -hmm. and slowly I kept building up my clientele and started like climbing the ladder corporate wise while like my kids were at swim practice and I would be doing my freelance stuff on the sidelines. Right. And then um, 2020 hit and my kids were in virtual school. I had enough clients where I could have launched my business if I wanted to. So I said, why not? <laughs> I'm going to launch now. <laughs> How about that? So you're at home with the kids. Um, was your corporate job still going on at that point? Yeah. Okay. yeah, they did not want me to leave at all. I They actually became a client. How about that? Yeah, so that was really nice. But, you know, at the same time, I was I was ready and I couldn't be in a position where I had to be stuck at a desk nine to five. I had to be accountable to be available to them nine to five when my kids were in virtual school and I had to make sure they were on their Zooms at the right time when they had class. It just didn't work for me anymore. Right, right. How old were your children during that COVID? Um, I had one in pre-K and the other one was kindergarten and then first grade. He was yeah, still in virtual. I, I, I often marveled at people that were able to do that. Um, it would be so challenging also yeah. keeping up with a corporate job. I it, can't was, imagine. it was really hard. I had to run their virtual school while building my business 
and transitioning out of that corporate life all at the same time. I don't know how, looking back, I don't know how I did that. <laughs> well, well, we're curious. So when, tell us about starting the business. Did you, you had been doing freelance, so <laughs> it, it was kind of gradual, I assume. Super gradual until it wasn't. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> tell us about that transition. So, yeah, I always had freelance clients on the side for like a decade. Right. And when I had decided that I was going to take it full time about six months before I did. So I set that leap date in my calendar and I went all out on filling the contracts that would cover my salary. So that's what I did for six months. I worked on building my personal brand and filling those contracts. And then by the time I left, I had six figures in contracts ready to deploy. That's and cool. then I just went after it. <laughs> well, that's really interesting. So you were just going to make sure that you could cover your corporate salary. And then you, you said you launched your brand. Tell us what you did. Yeah, about about six months when I had made that decision beforehand, I just I decided I started testing out what I thought would make sense to be my thing, the thing that I would own. Right. So I just made like mind mapped. What are the things that are uniquely that I'm uniquely good at? And right. I started testing on LinkedIn and writing posts about those things and seeing what resonated. And the thing that resonated the most was how to market with a small team. How do, how do you market when you have zero to two people in that marketing That's department? Good. And good. it like hit home for a lot of people. So I was like, I'm going to go all out in this and talk only about this and serve those people. And uh, I guess I got lucky because <laughs> that it remains to be what, what works for me. That's terrific. And well, obviously you can market yourself, you can market other people. So that might have been the best, the best thing for you was to go out and test that. So tell us, um, what about the business end of the business, like um, the bookkeeping and um, all of the things that go along with it? Good was Lord, I made scary, a lot of Or you knew what to do? No, I did not know what I was doing at all. I was guessing <laughs> okay. I could market. I could fill those contracts, but I did not know what I was doing on like the ops end and the finance end of things. And I made so many mistakes early on. Was it just you or you had um, either a, a 1099 employee or your, your accountant or your attorney? Who were your advisors? At first, it was me. Um, the <laughs> right. first... I brought, actually, I brought in a VA before I even went full-time because I needed someone who could do the communication with my clients while I was at work. Got it, right. <laughs> so I brought in the VA early. And then the next person I hired was a bookkeeper because right. I learned quickly, like that can get really overwhelming and messy if you're not on top of it. Right. And then I hired an awful CPA who screwed up my taxes two years in a row, but I didn't figure it out until two years later because I was audited. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so that was my big mistake. <laughs> that's interesting. How did you go about choosing your accountant to begin with? Because that's something that uh, we haven't talked about too many times on, on air, but that does happen to small businesses. In my career, I've seen a lot of businesses that end up with a not great CPA, to put it nicely. How did you choose the CPA to begin with without naming names? They were recommended, uh, um, but it wasn't by someone who had worked with them before. Like, okay. It was... A friend of someone. Yeah, it was. It wasn't... <laughs> there wasn't... Um, they didn't have hands-on experience with this person and they felt so bad after what happened, well, but sure. you live, you learn. I'm still paying that off. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow. That, that is traumatic. And then how did you go about choosing a new CPA? I think this I is good information. I was smarter about it. Um, so I brought in, I had an attorney who did my LLC 
Yes. And he's local, really, mm-hmm. really smart. And he works with who my CPA is now. So I went to okay. him. I went to my attorney right. first. Right. And I said, do you have any recommendations? Because he's an attorney only for creatives. So I'm like, oh, he probably has. That yeah, very yeah. nice and niche. So That's I'm like, great. he probably has an accountant for creatives that specializes. And he did. And she's amazing. And my taxes have been flawless ever since. Oh, that's wonderful. That can be a a really serious problem. We've seen that before. Yeah. So um, did you bootstrap your business or did you have to get financing to start? I bootstrapped it. Mm -hmm. And again, I made mistakes with that. Like it was during COVID. I could have gotten really low interest loans because of that. Right. But I didn't. I just bootstrapped it. <laughs> okay. Well, that that was kind of lucky for you that you were able to do that. And um, it, as you've gone on, so you basically were starting during COVID, which is in, in the scheme of things all that long ago. Tell us about the journey now. Um, how many employees do you have and how many clients do you have? Yeah, truly, truly as a journey. Um, so at the very beginning, I had to scale quick because I had about 13 clients and it was just me. So I brought on a lot of 1099s and, um, I had to start managing and being more of like the project manager slash strategist slash manager. (laughs) Right. And I couldn't do the thing that I was doing anymore. And I did that for a few years. And it just burned me out. It wasn't what filled my cup. So I kind of moved backwards. And um, yeah, midway through last year, I restructured my whole business. So I'd be able to do the client work myself. And I've enjoyed that a lot more. Wow, that's really (laughs) interesting. So you scaled up, didn't like being the manager, didn't like that you weren't doing the marketing work yourself, Mm -hmm. would prefer, is that it? That you didn't want to be an administrative working on your business. You wanted to be your business. Is that right? Yeah. I wanted to still do the client work and I still like, I am really systemized where I have my marketing days. So my marketing is always done for my own business and I'll hire people for the, on the business stuff. I'll hire strategists when I need to, or, and I obviously have my CPA, Right. I hire the experts for those pieces, but I like doing the client work. I like doing the marketing and I only bring in contractors when it's something that's not like my zone of genius, like design, for example. How about that? That's interesting. So they can help you with your specific client. Does that make it easier for you to sell? Because you can sell yourself. I know that yeah. in some businesses, we we get sold by someone who is essentially not the person handling the, the situation. I guess people must appreciate that. Yeah, I think that they do. I often get asked, are you the person who's, who I'm going to be working with? And they seem pretty pleased. I'm like, yeah, you're going to be just working with me. Yeah, that's great. So you, you're you still working with clients who have um, either no marketing department or a very small marketing. Mm-hmm. And tell us, what, what do you do? What is your primary job that you do for them specifically? Yeah. I help them build their own stage, essentially, their own media. So all of the little pieces that drive authority for your business, like I'll help you with your core content, your podcast, your live stream show, your videos, your article series. I help you with your partnerships, your email newsletters, your LinkedIn anything that drives the authority and results in lead generation. I like to combine content marketing with business development. So you're getting it. They're working together. That's terrific. So do the companies that you have, even though they don't have marketing departments, are they usually companies that have salespeople? Are they in, they're in a specific industry? Because you said that you seem to find yourself 
Yeah, I end up falling into that that world a lot. But um, I work with B2B service and SaaS companies, so no specific industry. And they were usually sales led or founder led. Um, a few of my clients don't even like they're big companies, multi multi million dollar companies, and they don't have sales departments. They don't have business development departments. They have me and they have the people that do the work that sell to people. That's really interesting. Uh, that's great. And so is a lot of your business driven by word of mouth or by your own uh, tiny marketing? <laughs> yeah. Um, most of it is driven by my inbound marketing because mm -hmm. I have my podcast, my newsletters, and I've been doing it now for a long time. So I, I have that google history where i'm easy to find right um but yeah word of mouth is really helpful i have a lot of referral partners who i met through my content marketing that's why i'm telling you content marketing and biz dev hand in hand right right so um what would be your biggest piece of advice to someone who's in corporate and wanting to not be in corporate what would you say to them Start building your personal brand early so it's easy for people to say yes. The thing that people struggle with is when you start, when you decide that you want to do this and you don't have any sort of authority within your niche, within your thing, it's a lot harder for people to say, okay, I'll try you out. But if you have been on LinkedIn or you have a podcast that is showcasing your expertise all the time, it's so much easier for people to say, yes, you've built that trust ahead of time. That's right. So with people doing podcasts on a regular basis, as we are here doing this as well, <laughs> um, I know that you have a podcast. Tell us how you started that and what you do on your podcast. Yes, it's Tiny Marketing, and it actually started as a live stream show the very same day that I started my business back in 2020. How about um, that? Yeah, I used it as a way to meet like my marketing crushes. So uh -huh. I would interview, I would interview that? smart people um, live on LinkedIn, and it became pretty popular. But it was also exhausting because I, it was live. It was truly right. live. <laughs> right. Sure. And it was hard to show up and coordinate. So a year out, I started, I turned it into a podcast and I repurposed some of those interviews into the podcast. And now it's podcast first, live stream second. Oh, okay. <laughs> and um, we talk about marketing strategies and systems that work for small teams or no team at all. Right. That's interesting. So it's mostly um, geared to the people that you want to attract anyway. So that. <laughs> I know that's, that's obviously what, what everyone is trying to do is reach people on, on some level um, to, to garner their, their interest. So um, how do you balance life and business? It sounds like you're very, very busy and you have your children are, you know, young and need yeah, they are young. <laughs> um, that was always a priority for me because I didn't start my business to work all the time. So as soon as my kids get home, which is in a half hour, uh -huh. I don't work. I stop working when they get home. Right. And um, I'm working and doing their after school club, which is what we call when they do homework. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I have, I pre-plan a lot and I do a lot of um, time blocking on my calendar. So I get right. all of my work done when I need to. I'm just really, really systemized. That's how I'm able to make it work. I, I would, I would think so. I wanted to just step back a little um, to when you made the decision to cut back your business. Yeah. Um, tell, tell us about how you came to that decision and what exactly you did to fire your clients, I guess. <laughs> oh, I didn't cut any of my clients. I cut my contractors. 
Oh, okay. Um, what I did internally is I, I built systems around how I was going to work with them. And I didn't cut them entirely. I just cut the capacity that I was working with them. So I started time blocking when I was going to work with them and I'd pre-schedule everything with my clients on my calendar. So I knew when I'd be working with those clients. Right. I didn't have to cut anybody. I just had to retrain them on how we were going to work together because I would be doing it in batches now instead of as needed. I see. Okay. And then that was the way that you could eliminate the 1099s and yeah, the, all, everything that went along with that, right? Yes. I just had to optimize my, my process. And then it really helped also just like operationally, it costs less to run my business that way. So from a profitability um, standpoint, you're still able to earn as much money revenue for yourself as you were before. Yeah, more. Less. Isn't that interesting? I mean, yeah. so many people are building, building to build that top line when really it's the bottom line and or the lifestyle that um, makes you happy and, yeah. and more productive. I, I'd say like the biggest impact is operational optimization looking at all of the little pieces of what you do, how can you optimize that? How can you make it more efficient? Is there anything that doesn't move the needle for a client? Maybe you could cut that piece of the project and um, it can be even better. Speaking of moving the needle for the client, how how do you, do you find that when you are um, working with clients that they want um they want measured results to, to see what measured results you've had in the past. And, and how do you document that for the use with future clients? Yeah, it's kind of easy for me because I'm working with my clients long term and I'm doing reports for them every quarter. So I have all of the data available to say this is how much I've helped them earn. This is how much right. we increase their traffic because I do the reports anyway. And maybe once a year, I'll put together a case study based off of the reports so I can showcase it without revealing the client and their, so yeah. it's not tied, their data is not tied to them. Oh, that's interesting. So the return on investment, um, is there a specific target that you have for them or each one is a different? Yeah, everything while my packages are packet, they're like productized in a way, mm -hmm. I customize it within the brief. So each client has their own metrics that we're looking at. The metrics are very interesting to, to other people, um, to a lot of everybody's data driven metrics driven, at least in large organizations, it might not be so much for the tinier people, but I'm sure they still want to know before yeah. they delve in uh my the main thing that i'm looking at is their partic like their goals what are their revenue right. goals how many leads do we need to bring in based off of your conversion rate to right. to get there and how many impressions do we need to get to that to that number to that lead number because that that is what we have to look at is how many impressions are we getting from our content that's leading to a lead. That's so interesting. So because you have different industries, how how do you determine what's reasonable for each of them? Like, how do you do that? Or is that like the secret sauce that um, you don't want to share? <laughs> well, I'm using I'm using benchmarks first. Like when I'm starting brand new with a client, these are benchmarks for your industry that we're going to try and strive for. And each quarter we measure against those benchmarks. Right. And then once I've been with them for a while, I can look at their past data and right. give them more custom numbers that make sense for them. That's right. That's right. So now that, um, you know, you've quote downsized or right sized your business. Yeah, right sized is a good way to right put it. Right sized your business. Um where do you see your company in three years or in five years? 
Um, I really want it to be, to remain small. I don't want to scale up. I, my priority is a lifestyle business and bringing right. in the clients that I really love working with. And I'd like to also, I'm beta testing this right now, but have a few offers that are one to many so I can support the smaller companies that can't afford to work with me one-on-one. -on -one. And I'm excited to see where that goes. I'm, I really, I love, I have a teacher at heart. <laughs> so I feel like this is going to be a fun direction to go. That's exciting. That's really exciting. So um, for all the entrepreneurs out there that are listening to us today, um, how can they get in touch with you? They can go to sarahnoelblock.com slash AMI, A-M-I, and I'll have a custom page for them. So they can find me where I hang out. I hang out on LinkedIn. I'm sure it's no secret from this conversation. Right, right. Um, they can find my podcast and then I'll share my LinkedIn workshop that I had last week, but I have it recorded for them so they can grab that and learn how to optimize their profile, get noticed on LinkedIn and start generating leads that way. That sounds really exciting. I, I mean, optimizing LinkedIn for all entrepreneurs is really essential. And for entrepreneurs, just giving advice and mentoring, it's great. Um, that's a great thing for them to do. Well, I really appreciate it. Is there anything else you want to leave with our audience today before we wrap up? Let's see. If you are thinking about starting a business, you don't have to be as chicken as I was. You don't have to do freelance for a decade, but prepare. Remember, start building that personal brand early so you have built a network and trust with that network before you launch so you have a built-in support system thank you so much it was fascinating to hear <laughs> about your journey and congratulations for being just where you want to be thank you i love talking to you thanks <laughs> so much thanks